Hello. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'm Peter Shipley, and I'm Ryan Guler, and we're here to talk about Insteon. Yeah. Uh, uh, I like giving outlines for talk. That's generally the outline. This talk I'm doing is a little bit backwards in a sense. I see a lot of talks at various conferences where they talk about the research, talk about what they're doing, and not basically hold the good stuff to the very end, like a mystery novel. Talks are not supposed to be a mystery novel. So I plan to after, you know, go over things, I'm going to give you the conclusion, then I'm going to talk about how I got there. Yeah. And uh, well, is, if it does really with Insteon, it's a wireless protocol. Uh, we'll get, you have a bunch of little devices like this, you plug around your house, get a home controller, you can turn lights on and off, activate sprinkler systems. Um, I got bored, I set my house up with it and started playing with it. I would say technology, it's run by a company called Smart Home. Uh, they control devices through either wireless or RF, pro or RF protocols. Something called dual band communication, which actually is an asset and a problem as we'll soon see. All the bases are capable, capable of acting as a repeater. So effectively, any light switch in your house is also an R radio frequency repeater. Makes it really easy to pick up their signals. Yeah. Now, what are they good for? Well, they've just recently paired with Google's Nest, and they've also paired with um, Microsoft's. It, evidently, they have little plugins for that. I've not actually seen it yet, but this is what why it's relevant. Insteon is, you know, Insteon by itself is not a true security problem unless you actually hook up your locks. But they're being paired up with more and more home automation. Home automation has become more and more of a product. This is the weakest link. And I'm giving this talk so the weakest link doesn't become part of the chain. Things you can do with it. No, I'm not trying to sell you the product here. Uh, you can turn your lights on and off, control your sprinklers remotely if you wish. Uh, locks, it interfaces directly into alk alarm systems. Uh, you have I.O. controllers so you can manage water pumps, all time remote sensors, all the usual things. As I mentioned about the weakest link, well, it's a protocol for light environment. It's being integrated in many, many other things. And this is a problem. Yeah. For example, uh, we have a lock on stage here. Uh, with this and uh, RF cat, I think you can pretty much we can open that lock. Hopefully we'll do that a little bit later. By the way, I'd like to point out here, just to be fair with uh, Moinstar locks, the lock is a good lock. It's not Medico, but it's upper edge slate lock. And the remote control is a rolling key code. So the Monster product is pretty good. The weakness is the Insteon bridge to it. Now, for those familiar with Insteon, you might have read their papers. They actually published a specification on their RF protocol. Uh, white paper, you could just Google white paper, the details will get owned. And this has been published for about 12, 13 years so far. The protocol has not changed. It's been, it's been heavily documented, heavy detail for the last you know, decade or so. This is a problem. They also have a very biased documentation compared themselves to other wireless protocols. You can read that if you want, but you don't really need to. Yeah. Well, after reading the specs, being a bit of a hacker, I decided, like, you know, I can invent I can, I can the RFCAT. I mean, I'm a pretty good programmer. I've been doing you know, C programming for 20 years. And so I wrote code to do it. My code didn't work. It failed spectacularly. Normally my code doesn't fail that bad. <laughs> Just a little bit. And I thought, this is interesting. I mean, as I tried to get the packets according to the protocol, I was getting nothing. So I investigated. I successfully reverse engineered the protocol. Took me a while, a lot of head banging. A lot of my friends got annoyed with me talking about it. Their protocol it, documentation is so full of shit. They ran out of ways of saying bullshit in my documentation. Okay, one of my things I could do is I'll give you a lot of space operas on my Kindle. I have space operas that contain less fiction than the protocol documentation. <laughs> Fortunately, but both of my friends have multiple friends. So let's get on to the fun part here. Let's talk about the protocol that we were talking about. The, you know, the good stuff. Well, this is what they claim to be the protocol. How accurate do you think this is? Frequency, bullshit. It's, off by, it, it's actually pretty close. It's off by a couple of K, but just enough to make your demodulation a pain in the ass. Manchester encoding, bullshit. 26 bits of Manchester followed by two ones, you can't decode it with Manchester. Believe it or not, they actually use frequency shift modulation. <laughs> bullshit. Bullshit. 
Bullshit. A3% <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> Insight describes frequency shift keying as you know, symbols that are modulated using frequency shift keying, blah, 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 modulates character. Bullshit and Klingon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, if you want to be more accurate, the frequency, the, the frequency of the deviation, actually, we back up there a little bit. Uh, they claim that the module is, you know, use a center character frequency shift by wind symbol. They actually got that, got that a little bit wrong. Deviation is a, deviation is a, is a shift of the center frequency to the one or the zero, you know, not the uh, entire thing. So basically, they got that wrong. Bullshit. So. Let's just say this was a typo. We're going to be nice to them. Um, you know, just clar clarify things. I mean, they're very. If you read the documentation, which I don't fully quote here, they're very, very, very clear to say. You know, the, sh the full shift is 64k. It's 150k. Now, what, on that point, what the actual spec is? And as a, yep. As you can see, this is the real spec. Real frequency a little bit off. Tokenized Manchester. I love how they claim to be um, in, you know, a little over 3,000 uh, data rate. It's more like 2,600K. <laughs> uh, the symbol rate, not even close. Now analyze packets some more. Look at, the look at the standard packet format. This is a standard packet that you'd expect to see something transmitted. Who here thinks that's accurate? Come on. <laughs> Hogwash. <laughs> the extended packet. Malarkey. Not even close. This is the actual packet order. And if I back up a little bit here, you can see that they talk about you know, there's a preamble, a sync from address to address flag, where reality. It's actually the flag to address from address. So the byte order they give it to you is even wrong. <laughs> it gets worse. They claim they ordered by byte. This actually had my head pounding on the wall for quite a while. It's figuring out the actual how the bits are encoded here. Um, I literally wrote a program uh, called XORD, which since I knew the MAC address of all my devices, and I figured it's an 8-bit processor, encryption would be that hard. So I wrote a program that basically takes my MAC addresses, flips them, reverses them, inverts it, and XORs every possible combination of my MAC address against the packet. And I was getting lots of hits. And someone pointed out I could feed Gideon's Bible into the program, I would get lots of hits. <laughs> so I went back, analyzed it some more. There's actually things that actually work. Uh, pass the laser. My laser is missing. I did not steal your laser. Oh. Okay. <sighs> laser, so you talk. Should I have this ready? Two points off of me as a speaker for not being ready. Oh. Okay. Oh, I, can't just <laughs> I can't even see my own screens. <laughs> So effectively, this is how it's, how it's encoded. Effectively, here's three bytes. Don't worry about it. They'll figure it out. Um, effectively, the three bytes, every byte's actually, every byte is actually encoded with, um, this, oh. Back yet? Back up one. Okay. Think of, think of, so we're just going to look at how three bytes are encoded. Um, the first three bytes are you know, 03, E5. The packet is actually set with a five-bit index number, with eight, followed by the eight bits. It's, it's transmitted least significant bit first, so we flip that whole thing over. And then Manchester encoded. It can make your life just wonderful. And actually, the lines at the top, that's actually a raw dump of the whole thing. Mind you, this only emits three bytes of packets. It's a very, very inefficient method of transmitting this stuff. Well, somewhat. It's not like Manchester's two to one. It's like three and a half to something. In the data, effectively, the packets, flags. Right, this is actually from the documentation. It's actually correct, believe it or not. Shocking. I think it's the only thing in the documentation that was accurate. Uh, Instagram also talks about uh, their message binary. They have a it's CNC. After researching this, it took me quite a while to figure this out. 
and it's complete poppycock. <laughs> it's not a linear shift register. <laughs> the actual implementation, which by the way, the, the second half was talking about, talk about how I actually cracked the, the CRC, which is a pretty good, interesting thing. Uh, basically, it's not even interesting. They basically shake the XOR, shift the upper interval. I tried describing this, and I tried, I tried actually working this slide out to make you can actually read what I'm talking about. It's just easier to say this. And yes, this will all be published, and I have a website with all the documentation for this. Now for the fun part. <laughs> Insteon claims to be secure. The security, to quote them, if I want to read my own slides here, is maintained by two levels of security. A link control system where users cannot create links without physical access to your devices. Bullshit. And basically you need to have possession of physical device. But then two or three pages later in the documentation they talk about software pairing. If you know the MAC address, you can get to it. So, yeah. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. <laughs> My Russian friends say it's garbage. Again, these are quotes from the actual documentation here. For, you know, they think to, keep, to keep things secure, the firmware prohibits you from, from reading devices you're not paired with. Who here trusts firmware to protect your secrets? Yeah, exactly. They claim they mask, they mask the high bytes of all traffic. Did I mention the RF protocol a few minutes ago? <laughs> you think I might be a little problem with the security here? So, yeah. Now, NCN relies on, on basically that they have a three byte unique address. They call it node addresses, I call it MAC addresses. It's easier to think that way. And they all they encrypt with basically unencrypted. So there is no security. They actually published an entire white paper, you know, descri you're describing their security versus in you know, Zigbee, which actually is an encrypted protocol, and showing how they're superior. Just, Another multiple thing that really annoyed me with Instagram documentation is their claim of encryption. If you're a security person with a sharp eye, you'll spot this, but a lot of my friends who I think are pretty good miss this one. You know, they claim that they support encryption in instead of messages. This is not quite true. Um, they support encryption just as much as any other layer two protocol does. You, know, you can pass a packet that is encrypted. A you know, white sheet of paper has, supports just as much cryptography as NCON. And if you, you know, if you read the, between the lines here, they says, you know, their extended packets can contain you know, encrypted payloads. It does not say they're actually encrypted. So, <laughs> you can tell who speaks what language or who laughs when I change the slides here. <laughs> You know, they may, they actually, this, is actually a quote, this is actually a quote from them. Extended messages allow for encryption of uh, AES-256. Uh, I think they said that because uh, Zigbee uses a lesser one. Yeah. That. Yeah. They do not support encryption. Instance does not directly encrypt anything. And the only reason I'm saying this is because you go through all the documentation, they mention they're encrypted about every chapter. Bullshit. Honest, and the reason being that I've never seen a, a company lie so heavily about their documentation and it'd be so clear text in transmission. <laughs> so let's get to the more technical stuff here. Now that I've picked on Insteon enough. How about reverse engineering? Uh, originally in this talk, I was going to say something to the effect of like how I cracked the radio protocol, all that stuff, but everybody here has been to an SDR talk the last couple of years, about two per year, of how to crack the radio. So honestly, Go with fun with IP or something like that. Those guys did just as good a job as I would at documenting how to basically reverse engineer an ARF protocol. I'm not going to waste your time. But what I will talk about is the checksum. Because when I, when I need to check, crack the checksum for this thing, it took me a while. There wasn't any good documentation on it. I read a lot of academic papers, talked to some pathologists. Nobody can give me good information on how to crack a CRC. So I figured I'd throw it in my slides and explain to you how you're going to crack a CRC if you ever need to. And it's actually not that hard once you figure it out. Now, their documentation claims they have a 7-bit linear shift register. Uh, bullshit. So, I look into this. Four should be dealing with 8 bits. Here's an example of some actual packets. If you, if you bring the packets together, if I XOR the packets, the uh, after the equal sign is the, what the XOR equates to. If you notice the first one, the, it always ends in zero. That effectively tells me that uh, the second nibble, or the lower end nibble, is a simple XOR the upper end nibble is not. Now we found a little bit how to crack, how to crack the whole thing. 
Next, I want, next we, we want to crack a CRC, what you want us to do is we want to look at the higher nibble. So because I was able to generate packets, a very, you know, I was able to generate 255 packets, turn my light bulb on 255 values, I was able to have generate packets of various information. But what I did was, since all these packets varied only by one bit, I simply XORed the packets together. The resulting data is only the changed bits. And what you've seen here is the packets XORed with themselves to only see the, the bits that have changed. And again, as you see here, strange enough, the upper nibble doesn't affect anything. So it's obviously not seven bit linear shift. Next thing you do is you vary your, your pack identity. With this, I was able to derive the formula. Again, this is how you crack an 8 bit CRC. In this case, to make it easier to read, I replace these zeros with, with dots, make your eyes see it. And from here, you can clearly see how the algorithm works. A little bit clearer might be this. And in this case, the algorithm is very simple. You take the first nibble, shift by one, XOR with itself, apply it to the upper hand. Again, proving they lied. Again, that's the nice protocol. Yeah. Aside from the standard procedure of identifying RF signals, like I said, I'm not going to waste your time with that one. I've written tools for this. I hope they'll be somewhat useful. We have a handful of tools designed to be you know, modular and reusable. I tried to base my tools off of uh, standard hardware. Standard hardware being uh, using, basically using, uh, using standard uh, you know, TV dongles, RF cat, and hack RF. Have a demodulator, or under modulator for this. Here's some example commands. I'll basically read and decode live streams of the data. And with those live streams, you can basically play, replay, and attack systems. To transmit any packet, same thing. Now, after this, I'll we'll give a demonstration of some of the software. After that, we'll have some question and answer. Tough crowd. <laughs> Okay. Run a little ahead of schedule, but. <laughs> so hopefully some of this will work. Likely uh, none of it will, but we'll see. Other one to do the dual band. Yeah, I'm trying to get to. All right, no video. Awesome. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, first thing we have going here is the lovely little RF cat dongle. You may notice this one is uh, soldered and hot glued. That's Pete's fault. So, very simply, we've got a couple scripts here. One's going to receive data from the RF cat and then output it to the screen, showing you what the packets actually look like once they are sane. And proving I'm not full of shit. <laughs> About this. Um, so, if you'll notice, <sighs> if you'll notice here, I have a very sane device that is a light switch attached to a power plug. 
So if you may think this is insane, but it's also a transmitter. So if I hit up and down, you'll see I start getting packets. So the 117828 here is, I believe, one of the lights that we do not have hooked up because we could not find a lamp. And the other IDs are various things that this is synced to. So if you want to turn on lights in Shipley's house, please take a screenshot of this and the tools will be posted after the talk. Now it works. So just for a piece of field in here, effectively you got the, the flags here, which is the only thing that was correctly documented in the protocol. You've got your from address, your to address, this. And it's interesting because in the documentation, they talk about how it's supposed to go to the, the from, it's the from address transmitted first. Uh, the reason that's not done is due to the way the pairing works, and you only talk, to, so theoretically, you only talk to devices that you're paired with. So you're actually more concerned about your from address than your to address when you're dealing with the protocol. More data? <laughs> I will also ask for anyone who works with encryption, does any of that look like RSA to you? <laughs> and you literally, with, with our tools, you can basically cut and paste in the transmitter, you know, simple replay attack, no problem at all. My tool, my tool even also regenerate the CRC for you if you decide to change something in the packet. We could prove that if we had a lamp. Yes, we tried to get a lamp for this room so you get the light bulb and the lock, but it's really hard to get a lamp in a hotel. <laughs> we tried. We even stopped by stores trying to find a lamp, preferably, you know, the, uh, we want the, the legless, the, you know, the stocking lamp, the leg. No, no one sold it around here. We, we looked. So, and I've attempted to sync this to the RF lock controller through the light switch to get to the lock, and I do not believe I got it fully working. It's incorrect, but. Uh. <laughs> and unhappy Python code. Yeah. But the lock does, in fact, actually work if you push the yeah. button and remember to bring all the gateway parts, yeah. not the ones you only think you need. Yeah, uh, that was my bad. I was packing things up from Berkeley to fly out here. I forgot the Insteon controller for the lock. I bought one on Amazon yesterday, had it FedExed out, and it doesn't seem to want to talk to my lock. My bad. Also, to note, if you want to use any of this, uh, you will, when you run the script and exit it, the RF cat will stop working until you unplug it and plug it back in. Yeah. RF cat's lovely. Although, Standard debugging strategy applies. Although one thing I have learned about, the ARP cat's a wonderful device, but it is really finicky. And what actually with the pain in the ass with this protocol is ARP cat likes either you know, like Manchester data or non-Manchester data. Unfortunately, with the Insteon protocol, it's 26 bits of Manchester, two ones and 26 bits of Manchester, so the dongle would not receive it. The workaround for that is you simply put the dongle into uh, carrier mode, 
without a sync bit, and you receive it and decode the raw data for yourself. Yeah. And when you transmit, very similar, RFCAT will transmit its own, you know, the preamble, the code ignores it, and then uh, transmits things. Uh, the most annoying thing is, uh, I meant to sh actually put it up here, is that because of the two ones between the Manchester, you look at the data and you see four ones in a row, three ones in a row, something that's not supposed to even exist in the data stream. I already banged my head on the wall for about a month. You know, I was basically looking at my demodulator, what I do wrong, you know, is my timing off, something, you know, what's going on here? <laughs> Finally you know, dug into it, no, they just broke the, they just broke the Manchester encoding. Uh, the question is, they provide different documentation to vendors. I've asked the vendors. They, they told me they're on non-disclosure and can't talk to me about that. Uh, there, is, there is a command to turn off RF in devices. But again, they weren't allowed to tell me that command, your non-disclosure. I'm working on that. I plan to reverse engineer. Now that I, now I can read protocols and transmit protocols. Okay. So we have a tradition here at DEF CON for our first time speakers. Many of you might be familiar with it. Now, usually my cohort in crime comes out here with a bo giant bottle of Jack, but he absconded with it. So I have a bottle of Jack. <laughs> now, also equally funny, this is a tradition for uh, first time speakers. Now, What's funny is Pete's not a first time speaker at DEF CON. Not it. <laughs> he is. <laughs> Which was hilarious to me because I was like, you know, so Pete's been speaking at DEF CON since like six. So yeah, and you, you, you. Hey, hello, I am the FNG. Don't drink it yet. Is so. coming up? No, he's, he's not a first time speaker. Okay. He's cool. So, congratulations, you made it to DEF CON. DEF CON. Uh, Ooh. Ooh. That was bad. You want the second one? Yeah, sure. <sighs> so if anyone needs a donation of chess hair after the talk, <laughs> see any of the three of us and we'll be glad to donate. Ah. So, uh, back to the slides here. I'll keep, yeah, leave it that way. You, keep it, uh, you scroll back up a little bit to be like the beginning of a, of a clean packet. Uh, yeah, that'll be good enough. So in here, the way, when I wrote my tools, by the way, I wanted to avoid byte order problems, bit order problems. So all my code actually talks to each other in ones and zeros. So my demodulator spits out ones and zeros. The preprocessing deals with that. Are you here familiar with uh, NetPBM? That's how, that's how Jeff Boskaj got around the problem, that's how I got around the problem, which makes my code a lot port more portable. I wrote, I literally wrote my tools not just for Insteon, my demodulator you know, works without knowing the offset. I can actually give a talk and bore you to death right now on how to use Arctan to demodulate stuff without having to do any fast forward A transform. Trust me, it'll kill you. But uh, what I'll show you here is, remember I told you they, they invert the, the ones and zeros. So we talked about the two ones, so in this case, we have, at the end of a new packet, new line, you're gonna have uh, one zero, one zero, one zero, and we're the bastards. You want that, see the three, I can see three zeros right there, that represents the three ones. That's another packet, another set of three ones right there. Yeah, and those are all the cases where they put the extra ones into the code so you can't de-Manchester it. But yes, I'm calling zeros ones because they invert the frequency shift. Yeah, I really think a bunch of guys sat at a table with a bunch of beer and like, you know, let's make this hard. I know, we'll flip it over. Oh, we'll also do reverse bits. Oh, let's put a couple of things to screw with you. As you can see, yeah. it worked. And uh, I've not, uh, how's it, the question is how's it compared to the power line protocol? I have no idea. I'm afraid to hook up my gear to power line. <laughs> if we, you would like to hook up your gear to the power line, we yeah. will watch and put it on YouTube. And we'll... <laughs> Uh, we're, we're working the code effectively. You know, my, my software I've written is trying to be you know universal. It works. I've tried to apply it to a few other things. My demodulator, which I wrote for this, I use it off a key fob. Demodulate no problem. All you need to know is a baud rate. So hopefully these tools will move on to be useful for other protocols to crack. Um, 
I really said, tried to write some slides on how I actually cracked the protocol. I really can't say how. I basically stared at it until it came to me. <laughs> uh, I literally, you know, like I said, I wrote an XOR program. I could have had Gideon's Bible when it came out. Finally, I stretched the screen out wide and I started, you started seeing the rivers and streams in the data. And once I spotted the rivers and streams of data, I saw that you saw those patterns, and it's just a matter of analyzing the patterns. You know, I would really hope through this talk you say, this is how you walk through to crack the actual protocol. This is how I did it. I can't say how I did it. I just stared at it, eventually saw the patterns, and the human mind took care of it. The human mind kind of led me enough so that I could start doing it technically. Sorry. <laughs> also, for anyone curious, this is the command that would have actually turned on a lamp had we had one. <laughs> How are we doing on time? Um, severely, painfully early. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Well, I guess we have time for questions now. Yeah, we're running really, yeah, we're running really fast, fast talk. Well, I guess we have time for Q&A. If not, we'd escape the crowds. Uh, you can replay back, or if you know, if you ever, if you ever programmed a PLM, it's almost the same commands, just slightly different order. So you could, you know, yes, you can do cut and paste and do playback if you want with the hexadecimal, or you just reconstruct it yourself. Yes. Oh, right, early, so I told you, but that's way off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the question is how to how to mitigate this. Uh, there isn't any real way of mitigating this. As I mentioned before, you could turn off RF in your house, and fortunately there's no way of doing that because the, the command exists in the devices, but it's not public. Hopefully I'll be able to reverse engineer this, I'll sacrifice a few light switches by sending random commands to it, and, uh, but there is a way of fixing it. Hopefully in Seon after this talk, we'll put out a fix, allow you to actually turn off the RF so that your house isn't full of transmitters. And by this is 950 megahertz, a decent 900 megahertz antenna, I've got a pretty good range on that. Yeah. Oh, that's the oh, that's the good point. I'm going to get to that. Uh, these devices are not firmware upgradable. <laughs> yes, that seventy dollars light switch you have in your wall cannot be upgraded. Yeah. Uh, I don't own any Z-Wave yet. I do have a bridge for it. Uh, Z-Wave is actually encrypted. Questions? We head to the bar. Yep. Uh, the customers work cost money. <laughs> I have posted on their internal forums. I'm doing this. A couple of people challenged me, like, that's not a security problem. Why are you going to talk about it? Well, because they lied. <laughs> and again, as I pointed out, yes, turn light bulbs on and off. It's not, it's not the end of the world. It's not going to bring down planes. It's not an act of terrorism. It's not true security. But Insteon, you know, has paired up with Nest, Google, and other big partners. To be, the, to be the baseband communication between that and other devices in your house, and it's a weak link. Let's address it before it becomes the weak link. How big is their antenna? Uh, well, their devices themselves make it about halfway across my, my 1,500 square foot house. Uh, I have a nice uh, you know, 5 or 9 dB antenna, no problem. And as you know, with radio, if you can see it, you can control it. Questions, answers, accusations? Oh. All devices, all devices, all devices repeat. So if you have a light switch, if a light switch and a control device which are on hardwire, all your switches will, will also bridge it RF also. There's no stop. It, basically all repeaters repeat everything. Packets are limited to a three hop count, but that makes up for your network anyway. I think I can actually demo that real quick. What's that? Yes, uh, this deaf guy will get the slides, they'll put them up places. And uh, I guess I'm and at the slides, the slides will also include a, a, my GitHub. My GitHub is Evil Pete. And I meant to have the slide up there, but uh, I'm about to hook my computer up again. But thank you, slides. But yeah, uh, get Evil Pete at GitHub. When I sober up on Monday when I get home, I'll put all the, post all the code up there. Yeah, so if you will notice, I was able enough. to uh, get this paired, but right here at the bottom, these are the commands from the, uh, from the lock controller. 
when I pushed the button and undid the lock, and if I unplug the light switch, you should not see those repeat. Oh. Basically, those are the command. Those are the commands to unlock the front door. Oh. Well, I guess we're done early. I'm not going to waste your time. Enjoy.